Hey, welcome everybody. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us here on Wrestling with the Law and Stuff. I am Eric D. Anderson, as you can see right down there, Sin Lawyer. Uh, we've got a wonderful guest uh, today, as a matter of fact. Uh, he was my history teacher when I was in uh, high school. I had more than one, but this is the one that stuck out the most. Just a phenomenal career as, a, as an educator, a loving husband, a uh, happy father, very proud. We'll get the chance, I think, as well, to talk about his daughter, who knows a bit about storytelling as well. Uh, and a, a very proud grandfather. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I introduce you, please, Mr. Richard Garrison. Good day, Mr. Garrison. Morning, how are you Eric. doing? Good morning, sir. How are you doing out there? Good. Good, good. So we want to jump in right in with, uh, first of all, you said you were history teacher. How long did you teach? I was uh, in a classroom at various levels for 21 years. And, and then, then how long? Did 15, 15 in an office. Okay. And in the office job, that was when you were running the uh, the PACE program, correct? Uh, 13 of those 15 years were as the administrator for PACE. Uh, the first two of the 15, uh, I was the administrative assistant to the assistant superintendent for high schools. And, oh, let's, well, actually, let's talk about that for a little bit. The oh, assistant, yeah, the assistant superintendent for what's the full title again? For high schools in Long Beach. Right. And what was the? Let's talk about the the responsibility in that particular job. Uh, as AA. Yes. Well, <clears throat> it was. Uh, it was a. I'm going to have to give you a little. Pardon the expression. History on that. Sure. Go right with it. Um. Yeah, just as a, a rule, we never have a complaint about history being discussed here. Okay. Uh, about, and I'm ballparking this, about mm -hmm. 10 years before I got that job, which was in the, uh, the early 90s, uh, the Long Beach Unified School District had made a decision that turned out to be terrible. What was that to And say? that was that they would... Uh, eliminate the uh, assistant superintendent for secondary education and create what they called areas. And the areas were linear as opposed to, um, I guess I'd say chronologic or group. Instead of being uh, junior high or middle school through high school, the areas were K-12. And what was and the weakness the with that? the areas were intended to link the, um, uh, the all the feeder schools so that all the schools that fed Pauly, elementary and middle or junior high, were linked with Pauly and under an area superintendent. And that was true of all the high schools in Long Beach. The problem with that is that there's one high school and there's heaven only knows how many elementary schools and uh, quite a few middle or junior high schools. And so when they all got together to discuss issues, the high schools had very little opportunity to say anything because nobody had anything in common with them. And so also high schools are um, a harder case. Uh, there isn't as much time to correct problems that have occurred in a kid's education by the time you get to high school. And so when you were, look, when you were an area superintendent and you were looking at where, where could you have the easiest and most impact, you looked down, you didn't look up. And that was the period of time under these area superintendents. I don't know whether this would have been in your memory or not, but there was a period of time when um, you, you, were, you, were, you were gone by now, by that time, I think. But this was a period of time when there was a lot of guns and violence on the Long Beach campuses. Mm. And yeah, that would have fact, been close to me, yeah. Yeah, it was rare that we went, uh, 
a week without finding a gun on one of the high school campuses. That was when they started uh, wanding kids and doing yeah. all that stuff. And after a while, they came to the realization that, th that the areas weren't working, that you needed a somebody who was solely focused on high schools. And they had a, a, a lady down at the, uh, the board building who was assistant superintendent for personnel at the time by the name of Helen Hansen. And Helen uh, is, was an absolutely brilliant, wonderful, probably the most brilliant educator I've ever known. Probably one of the most brilliant people I've ever known. Helen, you know, another aside here, education benefited for years because women were discriminated against. How so? Because they couldn't go into other fields. Education got all these wonderful, brilliant people cheap. Helen would have been uh, uh, a senior executive with a corporation if she had lived at a different time. Mm -hmm. But she didn't. She lived when she lived. And she became the, uh, uh, the first uh, female uh, junior high school principal in Long Beach. She hired me. She became the first uh, female high school principal in the history of Long Beach at Lakewood High School. She brought me over there. Yeah. And we, we just developed a life, lifelong uh, relationship. And uh, uh, so uh, Helen really uh, was brought in to clean things up. And one of the things that she did was she brought together all of the um, uh, assistant principals who had become fearful of suspending anybody because that was considered to be uh, not uh, a good idea. It was, it was a, a poor policy. Well, the problem was kids are smart people. And pretty soon they realized that if you couldn't get in any trouble, you could do pretty much anything you wanted. And so she brought all the assistant principals together and told them, look, if a kid breaks an authentic district or state discipline policy, give them the prescribed discipline. And uh, it was remarkable. <laughs> the kid, I mean, kids are wonderful. They'll show you how that they're they're smart. Things changed almost overnight. Within two years, uh, the schools were pleasant places to be again, <laughs> and uh, nobody got beaten up or anything. I mean, in terms of kids' educations, they simply said, "Oh, okay, we know what to do now," and they did it. And I had the I had the privilege of of spending time with this really brilliant human being and uh and it was it, that was the main reason i left the classroom was that she offered she asked me to be her aa when she was given the position and the opportunity to see uh that side of education uh with somebody i respected so much was just something i i i couldn't resist couldn't pass and up. that's how i went into administration well, then let's talk about um, when you when you became an administrator, obviously your communicative skills were the same, but the goals were different. So now that you were dealing primarily with a adult audience as opposed to with the, the student audience, how did you make that transition to be able to get one, the information out that you need to get out, but also to do it in a way in which you could get them on board? Well, you know, uh, <clears throat> I had the opportunity of, of, uh, of, I was the, I don't know whether you know this. I, in fact, I think you were in my first AP, AP class. I was. And uh, that was a, a peculiar year in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, back, uh, back in those days, lots of people didn't know what AP was. And, uh, 
I didn't really know what mm -hmm. AAP yes. was. It's a lot uh, more prevalent now than it was, yeah. I yeah, oh, it's yeah. Uh, but I th I sort of when uh, when they asked me to be the AP teacher in Pace, I thought we were talking about it just an accelerated class. I yeah. you know I hadn't had any. I mean, my background up until this time that time I don't know whether you know it. I was uh, uh, I had. I had made my bones with remedial kids. Well, no, that's quite a transition. Yeah. And um, in fact, the, the, I think the re they, they picked me for a couple of reasons to, to take the pace position. One was I think everybody else turned it down. Really? And uh, yeah, it was hard getting AP. Uh, it was hard getting teachers for pace. You guys scared you. And 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 pace parents scared teachers. Okay, that and, uh, I could see that. Yeah, <laughs> and there was a, also a lot of teachers were smart enough, even though they wouldn't admit it. I mean, they I'm not saying they weren't admitted, admitting being smart, but they were smart enough to know that while they were getting some a wonderful population to teach, it was a lot of work. Yeah, and uh, you know you could you you know for example. If when I assigned you guys um, uh, an essay, hell, y'all wrote it, so I had to read them all. <laughs> Whereas in the regular program, a huge percentage of the kids didn't write them, so you know, and they certainly didn't write as much as you guys did. So it's a lot. It's a lot more work if you want to do it right. Yeah. But at any rate, that first year. Uh, I don't know whether you were one of the ones who were immediately disappointed when they saw me standing in front of the class, but most of the kids and their parents were very upset because they had expected to get Roger Wyatt, who had been the only AP U.S. history teacher the program had ever had. Yeah, he was and legendary. My, my older sister had had him uh, okay. in pace. So, yeah, that was we knew the name, but I can't really say that, at least on my end, I can't say that I was – disappointed it was just that okay it was somebody there were a lot knew. of people eric who were, <laughs> who were very concerned <laughs> very vocal yeah and uh, i remember uh that when we came back when we had our first um what do they call it is it uh i've been out of is the first one back to school night i I think. And the second one, open house. Anyway, it was yeah. it was the one they had in October. Okay, that would have been back, uh, oh, all that the, would have been back yeah. to school. Yeah, yeah. You you um, you uh, that was the one where the parents didn't really know you, and what you were supposed to do is not talk about the kids, but talk about what the class yes was about. Mm -hmm. And so I stood up, and you, know, you have about 10 minutes to do it. And I, I had 10 minutes, I realized after the very first session, I had 10 minutes not to just talk about the, the uh, class, but to convince these parents that they shouldn't be in a state of panic. <laughs> and sometime between the time the first group left and the second group got seated, I had a moment of epiphany. What was the epiphany? And I, I, I stood up in front of that group and, and I said what I, I brought up the, uh, uh, the elephant in the room, which was that they didn't want me. And they were worried that I wasn't capable of doing this. And I said to them, and this goes to your question about finding a way to communicate with people. I said, listen, uh, I know you're concerned, you're worried, I'm not tested, but I will make you a promise that I will absolutely keep every day that I am in this job. I will give your child the education I want my child to receive. Oh, the tension level it was it reduced, it was palpable. It was just right there. And at that moment, I realized that in the job that I had at that point, 
uh, it wasn't just communicating history. It was communicating the reason that they needed and ultimately the kids needed to have a little faith in, in me because I was asking them to walk someplace that they had never walked before and trust me to know how to get there. I'm, I'm slightly biased here, uh, but I would have to say that I think you, you definitely pulled off that promise. <laughs> uh, all the years you're there, uh, as I think you uh, you saw, but you were also able to because you instilled that. And in my teaching career, having dealt with a variety of people, I, I understand your pain of dealing with people like me because I, I taught several people like me uh, when I was in uh, in the teaching profession, uh, and we're not easy. <laughs> we're not, uh, and our parents aren't easy. But I think that one of the things that you've just gotten across is the whole idea of whatever the job is, it's not just what the job looks like. It's not just teaching. It's something else. It's not just talking about the law. It's something else. And I think, and that's part of the fascination is when you get into that profession and when you start to discover that there's more to this than just what you thought, adjusting to understanding everybody's different, I hate to use the word agenda, but kind of everybody's agenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how long did it take you to pick up on that? You know, I, I don't know. Those those first months with you guys mm -hmm. um, were um, are kind of a blur, even even today. <laughs> in 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 October of that year, my mm -hmm. I had been in the position less than a month. My dad died, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so I was dealing with the loss of somebody who was central to my life at the same time as I was trying to figure out how to do this job that I didn't really know anything about and how to convince a group of kids and parents that uh, I was going to do the job they needed to uh, Done. I'll tell you something else, though. This is one yeah. thing that I do remember about your class. I'm talking about the whole group. Yeah. Not any one particular class. And um, that year, uh, I am not ashamed to say that I fell in love with you guys. Um, and that probably helped a lot. And the reason I fell in love with you guys was because you guys gave me the gift of patience and tolerance. You made it possible for me to say in front of a group of people, and this isn't false modesty, I'm not a dumb guy, okay? I know that. Uh, I'm married to a brilliant woman. I'm married to somebody who's basically a pastry. Um, so am I. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. That. Uh, but, um, but I was, uh, IQ-wise, I was the least smart person in that room. And in every one of my classes. And yet those people... And this could have been frightening for me, but you guys treated me with such tolerance that I wasn't afraid to say to you guys, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I'll find out. I do and recall man, that. that yeah. is a gift. It, you know, when I, uh, when I was a younger attorney, I recall as I was getting ready to leave one, uh, one courtroom to go to another courtroom as far as an assignment goes. I was talking to one of the local judges and uh, we were in chambers. And one thing she said to me is she said, look, said uh, one of the things you can't be afraid of is don't be afraid to tell a judge, I don't know. Uh, and then go from there. Because sometimes as, sometimes as attorneys, we will, particularly when you're young, you're afraid to look as if you don't know what you're doing. I think almost everybody in every kind of business goes through that at some point where they don't, they're afraid that they're going to be 
almost exposed because they don't know. And she she yeah. was very clear on that, and that just say you don't know, you'll find it out. And I remember her also saying, what you don't know today is going to be very different than what you don't know 10 years from now. And she said, in 10 years from now, you won't care that you don't know. You'll just say you don't know. And <laughs> she says, you might as well get there now. Yeah. Uh, and I think that that was a, an important thing that, that uh, you established too. But it also helps your credibility. If you tried to BS us, I think it would that would have been harder. But because you're saying, I don't know, well, hell, most of us didn't know any better. I mean, you know, Larry Schwimmer obviously knew better than everybody all the time. Um, you know, you know, John Kim, the Feinberg twin, I mean, people who were just yeah. and some of these people I'd known since kindergarten. So I always thought that their intelligence was sky high. I used to wonder why am I sitting here with these people? Uh, because they're really smart. <laughs> I'm not. Um, and so I think that that was one of the things you, you, you've touched upon, being able to admit that you don't know. And then working from there just gave you more credibility with everybody. Well, yeah, you know, it was, it, it's a, it's a, all I can say is that you guys created the environment that allowed me to do it. I mean, I don't know if you guys had been the people that I think a lot of people refuse to teach in pace because they're afraid you are and you aren't. But if you had been that mythical group that you turned out not to be, I probably, I might not have had the courage to say, I don't know. But well, that's not who you guys were. You, you are, you, Pace students and Pace parents were among the nicest people I've ever known in my life. Well, I got to tell you, behind closed doors, we, we could all be a little different. <laughs> that's for sure. But I think one of the things that also helped, and I want to touch upon this, because we talked about this before we started recording. Um, there was something that occurred after I graduated from high school. I was working as the uh, as a teacher's aide to Mr. Gillum, the speech coach over at mm -hmm. uh, at Poly. So I was about I was about 19, 20 years old, and I was talking to you in the teacher's lounge. And one of the things that you were talking about was one of the reasons you liked being at Poly and you loved the department you were in. And you mentioned this. You said that one of the things that was a problem for you at other schools you'd been at was that you would go into the teacher's lounge and during break, the teachers would be talking about anything, you know, sports, the weather, news, anything. But the history teachers weren't talking about history. The science teachers weren't talking about science. The English teachers weren't talking about English. And you thought, how in the world could you possibly show these kids to get them excited about the subject if you're not excited about the subject? So I think one of the issues that I learned from you, and I think that helped you, was the idea of finding your passion and conveying that passion. I think that was that was the number one thing about you. I think almost all your students will say is your passion for the subject was blatantly obvious. I mean, when you come into the classroom wearing a a a union, you know, a union soldier's uniform, clearly you've got passion for the subject. When people turn around and and they realize in a CBQ. Uh, or was it a, a DBQ? Yeah, document-based question. When they look at that and they're looking at this painting of John Brown, and someone shouts out, "That's Moses!" and you and you shout, "Yes, it's Moses! That's exactly who he's supposed to be." Yeah. And and remember, this is over thirty years later, and I still remember that to this day. So let's talk about how were you able to one? What gave you your your passion for history? Uh, and what was it that you were able to do to figure out how to get that passion and show it to others? Well, I'm not sure I can answer the, the second. I, you know, I, res I was really resistant uh, to becoming a teacher. Really? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Why? Uh, because I had been a real jerk as a high school student. <laughs> and I thought if, you know, if God was just, this was not a place I wanted to be. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I, I, if we got to say, I'll tell you this little story that yep. you know, uh, my mom went through, a, my mom had uh, Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And, but it was back in the day when nobody knew what Alzheimer's was. Yeah. And watching that wonderful woman go, and in my senior year in high school, she was uh, 
she was starting it. And uh, wasn't terrible at that time, but it was definitely a change in this smart, dear, funny, nice woman that I'd known all my life. Mm -hmm. And it began to really play on my mind. And I, to be honest, I don't know whether we're supposed to say something like this, but I, I started drinking. And... Uh, oh, you can be as honest <laughs> as you want to be. When, when you see the interview I did with Pat Cronin yesterday, trust oh. me, souls have been laid bare here. This okay. Is so anyway, um, it, I can remember there was a time when... Uh, for, for reasons that I can't understand, I had somehow or another failed to take my general art class as a 10th grader. Mm -hmm. And so there I was in my senior year with all these 10th graders taking an art class, and I was drinking. And uh, we had a, a brand new... Um, teacher i think it was her it was her first year she she wasn't tenured yet her name was briggs miss briggs and uh and i'd had a, a night out it was a school night i'd had a night out and uh i was sleeping in her class mm. and uh, this was in the 400 building at uh, wilson high school on the second floor on, on the park avenue side and um, uh, she came by and pushed me and said, you know, wake up. You got to get back to work. And I, said, mm. and I sat up and then I, she walked away and I laid down and went back to sleep again. And I, I think I, I, I'm not clear on how many times we went through this routine. But, um, you know, two or three. And then she came and did it again. And I looked at her and I said, if you don't leave me alone, I'm going to jump out of that window and ruin your chances for tenure. And I went back to sleep. Now, years later, Miss Briggs came to work as the art teacher at Lakewood when I was a teacher at Lakewood. And I will tell you, I stayed away because I was so ashamed. <laughs> I never want her to put two and two together and uh, realize who I was. But I was, a, I was a bit of a case in high school. So I really wasn't uh, looking forward to being a teacher. In fact, I, I was thinking about going into getting a degree in business. My dad was a business man. And, um, you were afraid of I karma. Finding myself drawn back to, to history. And finally, I, I gave into it. And uh, oddly enough, um, uh, I think this will become part of a subject that we're going to talk about later, mm -hmm. so I won't step on it now. But uh, it's okay, we'll, it, we can get the organically go right ahead. Uh, well, I'll I'll, I can ease around it. It'll, mm -hmm. it'll come up later. Um, but uh, they weren't really hiring history teachers mm -hmm. that looked like me back in those days. And so finally, I, I got my job teaching by accident. And um, uh, it was teaching GOC, Guidance Opportunity. Yeah. I don't know whether you know where that is. I have that's no idea. Kids, that's the Go. 18 kids who hate school the most but haven't dropped out yet. Oh, my mom taught some of them for a while. Okay, yes. Yes. Lindbergh okay. Junior High School. Yep, that's exactly it, yes. North Town. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, I, you know, the crazy thing is, I loved Lindbergh. Uh, and um, then... Because I, I was a successful guidance teacher, and uh, th they took me out of it because it was considered aberrant. The fact that you were a successful guidance teacher was not an indication that you were going to have any success at all teaching people who weren't guidance students. So 
they they put me in reading. Now I had an English minor, but I knew nothing about reading. And I went to Helen, the lady I'd talked to you about, who was my junior yes. high school principal at the time. And I said, Helen, you know, this is a mistake. You need to put somebody who's this these these are ninth grade reading kids. They they need somebody who's really, really a good person. These these guys. She said, you have to understand, this isn't a reward. Nobody else wants that job. I said, oh, okay. So uh, I piddled around in there, and I, be, I, I was never a good reading teacher. It's a terrible thing to do to kids in ninth grade. They need English, and yes. their reading skills will develop through that. And I was able to convince a principal of that, and I wound up creating my own um, uh, remedial English class and it was very successful but I was a long time it was a long time before I got my chance at teaching U.S. history and um, uh, I, I was I taught a couple of classes here and there at Lakewood and at Lindbergh but not a lot and then I was brought over to uh, Holly to teach, believe it or not, AP U.S. history. Okay, so so they and, threw you right into the right into the big uh, yeah the, the big and, pond there. Yeah, I was. It was because, as I told you, yeah, uh, they they couldn't find people who wanted to do it, and they they turned my name over to Nancy Gray, who was the founder of the program. Yes, she was out of the business at that. She was downtown at that time. As I recall, that's that's why Wyatt wasn't teaching because he became the the director hadn't he? right yes, that's sir. that's uh I, this is probably sort of um learned on the job you know in fact i got the job three weeks before uh before school started and so man i had a lot of i started reading garrity which we both know is oh yeah not a page turner <laughs> That's that's a slight understatement. Yeah. <laughs> that's a slight understatement. <laughs> well, you know, here's the thing uh, I want to ask you now is having done both ends of the spectrum, if you will, you know, the, the high achieving, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, type A you know, pay students, along with, of course, folks like my myself and others who I won't mention who were not necessarily type A, but, you know, we we were smart enough to do what we need to do, but didn't necessarily work as hard as we should have. Uh, and having dealt as well with the the other spectrum of the kids who are coming in without benefit of of preparation for for high school. Yeah, I was life. never prepared for anything I was asked to do. Nancy <laughs> Nancy said, told, you know, I asked Nancy, why did you pick me? Yes. And she said, because you have had you've had a career. I haven't told you all the things. But she said, when I looked at it, you've had a career of doing a wide variety of things that you had no preparation for and doing them exceedingly well. You know, you have just hit upon, uh, I think, something that we've we've tried to reiterate for people all the time, which is the idea of sometimes the best way of a career progress is doing something no one else wants to do and doing it better than anybody else has. Yeah. And that when you do that, you, you can progress very quickly. Uh, I found that in Massachusetts when no one wanted to do juvenile and I said, I'll do it. And that turned out to be a, a huge help because the minute I did it, suddenly juvenile cases were getting their jury trials back. And so I started doing trials you know, all the yeah. time. Uh, and that's how we got better. Uh, I think the other thing that you, you, you mentioned is because we said one of our goals here is to establish that I think lawyers are, whether it's on the written page or whether it's uh, a presentation to a jury or to a judge, we're storytellers. And I think that we're all better storytellers the more we know other people's stories. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things, and you can tell me if, if this is your assessment as well, one of the things that I think made you very good at, uh, actually great at being that uh, history teacher was, and probably as an administrator as well, was that you had all these other stories from people you'd seen, you could connect to people, you knew them, you saw them. So as I was asking about the differences between dealing with that, that high end here and that other end there, what were the commonalities that you saw when you were teaching? And 
what adjustments did you have to make for each audience, if if any? Oh, yeah, you had. You know, one of the things <clears throat> that I think, uh, for example, uh, guidance taught me. I had 18 kids. It, mm -hmm. that, that first class was one strange group of human beings. <laughs> I had 18 kids. Uh, I had a full class. Normally, you build over the semester, but when I walked in, I had 18 kids. That's wow. what that was. You, you were their, you were their one-room school. I taught them every class. They were not allowed to associate with the rest of the school population. Wow. Of that 18, I can't remember whether it was three quarters or two thirds were on probation. I had two eighth grade girls. This is, this is terrible. I had two eighth grade girls who were married. I, I'm, I'm sorry, married? Married. I actually went to their home because you would teach three hours and then you would do home visitations the rest of the time. I actually, this is, I'm sure. You, do you remember federal survey cards? Yes. Yes. Okay. I had to, I had to go to their different homes to meet with their husbands to fill out the federal survey cards. Were the husbands around the same age or were they substantially older? No, they or? were probably under 20 okay. or 20 or under. They weren't like, you know. 35-year-old men or something. Yeah, yeah. They were... Was they there a child adult, involved? They were adult kids, yeah. you know? Yeah. But, was, uh, was there a child I, involved usually? I never saw one. Okay. So I couldn't tell you. Yeah, that's, and, that's a surprise. And they, the, girls, the girls, quite honestly, dropped out in the first... Each of them dropped out in the first quarter. Um, you know, the which... I mean, it surprised me that I ha would have married children, but it didn't particularly surprise me that they left. Well, no, I mean, once they're married at in eighth grade, it's pretty obvious you know, kind of the track that's being created for them, yeah, not that they're creating themselves. A, they're going to have a, a, a road to hoe, as they say. Yeah. That had, as but, a teacher, that had to be extremely disappointing because what could you do about it? There's nothing you can do about it. No. And, uh, but one of the things that I found with these kids, I won't say it was with the, the married girls who I didn't really get to know all that well, but was here were these kids that I think most people thought they were pretty much losers. And it turned out I liked them. And I thought most of them were actually pretty smart. And uh, so there was a part of me, I think that those guidance kids taught, there's a lot more to people than what's necessarily obvious. So find it. And, um, and that, that kind of served me well throughout. And then, you know, I went and uh, uh, here's, am I using up too much time? Absolutely not. No, no, no. You, um, you keep going. We have plenty of, uh, plenty of time here. Go ahead. There was, uh, they, they moved me into uh, uh, reading because they didn't want to, to tenure anybody out of guidance. And so I did that. And I, I can remember that, um, uh, that my boss, Helen, uh, because I was uh, non-tenured, I was being what they called stalled every year, evaluated every year. Yes. She called me into her office for my, uh, my stall evaluation write-up that she was going to evaluate me on the basis of. And she said, um, would you uh, do me a favor? Would you... Um, would you agree to write down as a goal 
that you will achieve one month's growth for one month's work. And I said, okay. She said, no, this, she said, this is not a trick. She said, the reason I'm asking you is most people won't agree to that. And uh, she said, but just as a goal, I won't punish you if you don't achieve it, but just as a goal, would you put, I said, sure. So I, I, uh, I started uh, uh, teaching these reading classes and I, I, was, I was not a knowledgeable reading teacher by any stretch of the imagination. And it became pretty clear to me early on that the system that they were using to teach reading was dubious. So there came a time when these kids had to take some state test, uh, something like the California Achievement Test or something. I don't remember the name. Yeah, I remember those. But you had to pass it before you could graduate from high school and you started taking it in middle school, junior high in that case. And these kids had not passed it. <laughs> None of them. None of them. And so in, for reading. So I can remember I gave, they used to give us practice tests that, you know, we could, so the kids wouldn't be afraid of the test, of not knowing what the test looked like. Yeah. So I, I can remember I gave them one of the practice tests and it, it was apparent to me that they were just blowing it off. And so I, I said to them, uh, before we took the next one, I said, how many questions do you have to get right to pass this thing? There were 50 questions. Some kids said 47. <laughs> I, I said, no. no. They said, more? I said, no, less. Well, 45. No. And we went down, you know. Yes. I said, you need to get less than 50%. Maybe 24 out of 50. Huh? Honest. And I said, guess what? the hardest question on the test could be number one and the easiest question on the test could be number 50. They aren't graded upwards. They're random in terms of difficult. And so they took the test. That year, we had 19 months growth for nine months work. That's remarkable. Not because I taught those kids a damn thing. I had simply convinced them to take the test. At which point I said, you know, these kids are a lot smarter than everybody thinks they are. But, you know, Mr. Christian, that's the thing. You've, you've actually given one of the great arguments. And I hope that the lawyers watching this you know, get this and understand this as well. You just merely took a point that this is not as difficult as you think, think it is. And you walked them through a process you didn't promise them they were all going to get, you know, 100%. You didn't promise they were all going to do great. But you did promise them that if you just delve into this, something good can happen. And as attorneys, when we're advising clients or when we're presenting presentations to a jury some or to a judge, because sometimes we'll deal with stubborn judges who, of course, are, are, are bright people for the most part. But sometimes you have to say, look, if you just take a look at it on this particular angle, I'm not guaranteeing anything, but you might find something different. And I think you know one of the people we're going to have on later on is going to be uh, Rich Taylor, who is an in-house lawyer. And I think that's going to be really interesting to talk about how they have to come up with that all the time because sometimes in-house lawyers and lawyers in general are thought of, we're the people who always tell you no, as opposed to finding ways to help you get to the yes you want. And I think you did that. What they wanted was they wanted to feel that there's a value in doing this they thought it was impossible, yeah. and you told them it's not impossible. Yeah, and they, so they figure, what the hell? Take a shot. Yeah, and there you go. You know, we used to tell our students, uh, you know more than you think you know, mm -hmm. um, which may seem odd because we had a lot of know-it-alls. Uh, but but you're right; it's getting people to draw upon their experiences to try something different because they'll find out you're not you actually do know far more than you give yourself credit for, particularly with those kind of kids.
And as a result of that, I was able to, back in, back in those days in Long Beach, somebody had decided that at least in junior high, I couldn't speak to high school at the time. There were two options for English. You were in academic English or you were in reading. And I was able to convince my principal after that experience and after that, those test results that the best thing we could do for these kids was to not have ninth graders taking reading, but to allow me to set up a, a, a remedial English class that I designed myself. And uh, the kids did great. Well, what you did was you, you took the evidence and then you argued the evidence. That's what, and it worked. Yeah. You know, it worked in that regard. That is, uh, that's one of the things that I think it, it's funny because you, you do have this tremendous humility about you. Uh, and yet every single time there's another story that comes out where it's just like, no, 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 that's, that's incredible stuff you're pulling off there. Uh, and you're also proving something that I've said a long time. I've never been a fan of the adage, and you've heard it a million times from people, you know, those who can do, those who can't teach. Yeah. And I always think that one, people get the whole quote wrong because it's really about while you can do it, you do it. And when you can't do it anymore, you teach somebody else how to do it. But the other thing about it is every great teacher I came across could all do something else, but that's what they wanted to do more than anything was teach. Well, it, 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 it makes it a lot easier to uh, not pay teachers what they're worth. Yes, yes, it does. Oh, yeah. I'm sure you and uh, you and my sister Shavana have probably, if not had that conversation already, we'll probably have it again because that's one of the things that she talks about all the time uh, in her programs. Well, you've uh, heard me say it. One of the problems I think that education has today was the fact that in those years when women were discriminated against mm -hmm. in employment, they got all these great people for no money. Now they don't. You, you know, it's not that we don't get some wonderful, wonderful female teachers. They, they tend to be people who are pretty dedicated to what, what you know, education. Yeah, because you have but to. But back be. in those yeah. days, we were getting these spectacular people simply because they had no other choice, and and they they didn't have to pay anything because they had them trapped, and and education got stuck with that mentality of teachers aren't worth paying. It it, it sounds a little bit like uh, when the when. When the Major League Baseball integrated, mm -hmm. you, know, you the the Negro Leagues lost a lot of their talent because they could go elsewhere now, yeah. uh, and and it became an issue as well with um, certainly with a variety of HBCUs who lost some talent who were now going off to um, to the schools that they weren't admitted to previously, which is why now the value of the HBCUs you really have to decide that's where you want to go is to a, an HBCU, and you have people there who are dedicated to the mission dedicated to what they're turning out. And I think, mm -hmm. uh, if I understand correctly, that's the thing that's happened in teaching uh, from what you were able to see is that you know, the people in it are really dedicated uh, to well, being I, teachers. I, I, think, I think that, it, I think that, that, that uh, I don't know about, you know, teachers are, are people. They're, there are people who mm -hmm. go into teaching because they falsely believe they're getting uh, a three month summer vacation. <laughs> They're not getting a three month no. summer vacation. No. In any other job, you would say you're being laid off, you dummy, for three months. <laughs> you're not being paid. <laughs> but, you know. You know, you're the first person I've heard actually put it in those terms of you're being laid off for three months. Yeah, that's what you are. You're laid off for three months. Nobody's paying you. A vacation is normally thought of as being paid so it's funny because in the i'm thinking about this when i was uh when i was teaching i worked at three independent schools mm -hmm. of which two paid me during the summer the the other did not um and so in fact one started paying me the minute i'd taken the job actually 
and you're right. That is a different feeling than when you're like, okay, what am I going to do this summer? Because I'm not getting paid for it. Yeah. You know, I also want to touch upon this because you, um, you've you been well, around. Let me, the... let me say one other thing. Sure, go right going ahead. Going back to what did I learn? Yes. When when I got you guys in in um, AP US history, it it became apparent to me very early on that there was a distinct possibility. I didn't know that it was true, but there was a possibility that you guys might not be uh, the most efficient uh, writers of expository work that that my experience was that middle school English teachers, which I, who I had some experience with, tended to go for the creative, which is to say no particular structure. And so um, when I taught my remedial kids how to write, I didn't do creative writing, I did expository writing. And I created a little framework, a little chart for them on how to write an expository paragraph. Now, if you can write an expository paragraph using that framework, it's that's immediately transferable to an expository essay. An expository essay is simply a more complex expository paragraph. Um, and so when I started teaching AP US history about three weeks into the class, I decided we're gonna to have to take a little week break here and I'm gonna to have to make sure you guys know how to write an expository essay. For, for my former students who are watching this, the framework that I used in teaching you about the essays and the four pagers, those all come from Mr. Garrison. But the the framework I used with my AP kids in Pace was the one I used with my remedial kids at Lindbergh. Same thing. Same thing. You guys just didn't need as much practice at it. You got it right away. And they took a little bit longer in part because they had to convince themselves that they could do it. And did you find years. that once they knew they could do it, that the, it was then started to balance out a bit more? Yeah, you mm -hmm. know, uh, the the problem with a lot of, of the remedial kids that I dealt with was that they had to shed a lot of baggage. They, they were working against um, a sort of, um, they had convinced themselves that they were lesser. They wouldn't say it out loud, but they, 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 they need needed some convincing. I remember when I when I went to set up my remedial English class. I asked them. I said, "What, what is an English class?" I asked my reading. These were my kids who were in reading. Yes. They were going to be my remedial English class, right? I asked them while they were still my reading kids, I said, what is, what is an English class? Describe it to me. And they said, well, it's spelling and it's reading and it's writing and it's grammar. And I said, okay, what is the hardest of those? And they uniformly agreed that it was grammar. Hmm. And I said, so if I can teach you grammar and as a result of that experience, you find that grammar is easy, then clearly everything else is going to be easy too, huh? So you tackled the hardest part first. What they thought was the hardest. Yeah. <laughs> and so at that point, I was stuck with the fact that I had to figure out how to make grammar easy. You you and had to it, do the uh, 
I guess the best way to put it is the reverse pyramid. You had to take the from the complex and break it down to its most simple element so that then they could see the simple element. And then from that, they could do the complex. Well, you have just defined for me what I believe is the essence of teaching AP U.S. history. Well, I got it from you. That The reverse okay. pyramid I learned from you. Okay. You know, uh, uh, there are a lot of people who think that, you know, when you're teaching really smart kids or anybody, I guess, and, and you know a lot, the reason for doing it is to make the class harder. And I came to the realization that my job was to take something that was difficult and make it doable. Mr. Gretzer, would you repeat that again for all the young lawyers out there who, who've yet to do a trial or, or who, uh, in writing a, a brief, uh, seem to think that we need to, to use as much legalese as possible? Could you just please repeat that particular point? You know, the job of a good teacher is to make the difficult doable. God, that is, uh, you know something? If no one has made T-shirts with that emblem on it right now, <laughs> we should, because that is... It and I, I mentioned that because uh, we're going to have Les Thatcher on later on today, legendary wrestler who has said the same kind of thing. Uh, every trainer, every lawyer, everybody, I think every salesperson, every trainer that's it. It's make the difficult doable. Um, mm. and you've put it down in a nutshell. And I think, as well, what's fascinating is the idea of you were able to show as well that look, the same technique that you used for. A group of kids who were, and let's remember, because I, I don't mind saying this, that year, my year, we had more national merit scholars and no, more national achievement scholars than any other school in the country. It, so, was, it was unbelievable. Yeah. Yes. So, so, but the same method you used for us, the same method you used for the remedial group. And I think yeah. it's very important that it comes back yeah. to the, the craft of storytelling and delivery is you know, once you understand the craft, you can apply it across the board. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think that that's a that's very wooden esque of you. Uh, Loath as I am to mention a UCLA guy, but oh, my it, dad is a John Wooden believer. Absolutely, you know, uh, one of these days, folks, when we get the chance, we'll talk about the uh, the wooden pyramid of success, which is uh, probably about the the best life work you could you could possibly come across, uh, uh, even better than the Bible. But don't you know, worry, he sticks some Bible stuff a, in there too. A few too. years ago, this is a real uh, aside from what we're talking about. But a few years ago, a guy across the street, Rudy was the uh, the guy who managed Polly Pavilion. That was a kick. Wow. He must have had some stories. Oh, he was a good guy, yeah. Outstanding. Now, I want to talk as well uh, about something very important because you, were, uh, you grew up in Long Beach, correct? Yep. Yeah. I was born in St. Mary's. That's right. Um, and one of the things that we talked about when you were younger was you were talking about your life during the time span that you were growing up in Long Beach. And mm -hmm. you mentioned Dr. Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. And this is when we were uh, in school, this came up. And I think it's important because I want everybody to hear this kind of story to get kind of an understanding about communication. Uh, would, why don't you go ahead and tell us if you can recall, because I recall clearly, but if you recall, what it was that you said about who Dr. King was really talking to during that time period? Well, you, I, I don't remember that. Thing. Sure, I can I, say I, it. I, I know I, I have. I, I have another story that I held off talking about, but you talk about that, and then I'll, I think, I think the story I have will dovetail. Yeah. Okay, that works. Yeah. So we were there in, uh, in class, ladies and gentlemen, and as he was talking, one of the things Mr. Garrison talked about was, he said, you have to understand who King was really talking to. He wasn't talking to the guy in Dothan, Alabama whose family had been racist and wasn't going to for, for 180 years and was not going to change anytime soon. So he wasn't talking to the people in Mississippi because their mind was set. He said, and I quote, he was talking to people like me, a teenage guy in Long Beach, California, who didn't know many black people, who didn't see segregation, even though it was there, but didn't know about it, didn't see the signs because there weren't signs, but the but the message was still out there. So that's who he was talking to. He said it was people like us who had to take the step to make the change. That's what he understood. 
and how we got across. And I never forgot that, in part because one, it showed that to me, you understood exactly what he was doing. But what I also found great was that he knew clearly what he was doing. He knew who was lost and he knew who wasn't. Uh, and that he had a faith that there was the idea that if people, people elsewhere would get it and apply pressure to the people who weren't. Uh, and I just found that that was absolutely fascinating. And I, I think that one of the things that, about it was he, the way you presented it to us as well, it wasn't just that it was, it was almost matter of fact, but it was also clear that it, it stuck with you. It was a very important message during that time period for you. Um, well, Eric, so go ahead. It, did, it, it didn't uh, just stick with me. Mm -hmm. uh, it altered my life in uh, a very important way. Uh, I, I, would, I don't think I've ever told you this story or told a class this story. Um, when, when I uh, graduated from college, I didn't go through, and I'm ashamed of this because I know it hurt my dad. I didn't even think about it at the time. But when I graduated from college, I didn't go through my graduation ceremony. Mm. And the reason I didn't go through my graduation ceremonies was because I was so depressed about the fact that it was clear that uh, or at least it was clear to me that I was not likely to ever get a job doing what I wanted to do. At that time, uh, there was uh, a real push to uh, put more people of color and females in uh, education positions and hiring. And, and I think we all know that it is a lot easier to find a person to fill a, a history or an English position than it is to find a person to fill a physics or a chemistry position. And so they weren't going to be wasting a history opening on me. And that became apparent when I graduated from college or when I got my teaching credential, uh, I sent out a hundred, more than a hundred. <laughs> anyway. Okay. All right. Yeah. So Sorry let's go that. ahead. Right where you were saying, no, uh, and look, then I'll just look. dub it in. Okay. Anyway, this, the story I wanted, I wanted to tell you about that mm -hmm. uh, uh, is associated with Dr. King is this. Uh, I think that what Dr. King did for me as that white guy living in Long Beach, and I don't know why I was one of the lucky ones who heard this. I mean, you don't know. Yes. Yeah. But I was going through a time when I could have become a really bitter human being. Uh, because it was going to, I had been told mm -hmm. that a guy like me was not going to get a job in education. But because of Dr. King, I bumped into somebody who became central to my life. And that is a man by the name of John Lewis. And uh, I began uh, reading about this guy that most people didn't know anything about at the time. And uh, I became fascinated by this man who put himself at risk for something larger than himself. Um, there is, I wish I could remember the passage, but there is a, 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 a verse in the Bible that, say, that ends with say, saying, send me. And 
I am absolutely certain that there was no time in John Lewis's life where he said, well, somebody's got to get beat up, I, I, but I don't want to be him. Or no, I want to be him. He didn't want to be him. Nobody wants to be the guy who gets beat up, spit upon, degraded. And nobody wants that. But John Lewis said, send me. And for reasons that I can understand, that was a message that resonated with me at a time when I could have become bitter about my lack of unemployment opportunities. But instead, I saw that moment through the eyes of John Lewis. And what I saw was that somebody was going to have to pay the price for all that had been wrong before. And nobody wanted to be the somebody. It had to be somebody, and I had been elected. And I could either be bitter and let it distort my life in very negative ways, or I could say, move on, move ahead. You're doing something that's important. What's happening to you has to happen. Find a way through life. And John Lewis is, to this day, one of the two people in my life that I consider heroes, my dad and John Lewis. When I, gradu when I graduated, when I retired, uh, the that I was given by my uh, colleagues was a, a big plaque. It's, I mean, it's big oak that had been carved by um, uh, my secretary's father, who was a wonderful woodworker. And uh, it uh, had um, poly, excuse me, pace carved across the top and my years of service. And then it had the, uh, the rabbit. And then it had two uh, frames carved in it. One was a picture of me and the other was a picture of John Lewis because some people had, um, some people knew uh, about my relation. Well, part of it was because for years I had had a signed picture of John Lewis. I had the opportunity to meet John Lewis about 88 or 89. I was back in DC and uh, I went over to his office and uh, it was at night. They, you know, it was in June, July, maybe, where they were closing out business in Congress. And so they were having late sessions and I saw him on the floor of Congress and then he left and I thought, wow, I wonder if he's going to his office. And so I went over to his office and he was standing in his, the lobby of his office talking to some staff and, we, you know, and I said, I apologize for interrupting, but would you let me shake your hand? It would, it would mean so much to me. And he walked over and he shook hands. And he said, come on in, we're not doing anything. So we went into his office and yelled out to his aide, one of his staff members, uh, uh, bring us some Coke, uh, co Cokes and peanuts. You know, they're Georgia, Cokes and peanuts. And uh, he talked and he, he talked to me about his meeting with uh, A. Philip Randolph. And uh, it was, I didn't make as much of the meeting as I, as, I, as I wish I had, simply because to be honest with you, I was like starstruck. And, <laughs> uh, but at the end of the meeting, he said, I, 
he said, would you like a picture? He, he could tell. And I said, yeah. And so he told the aide to bring a picture in. And the aide brought in a black and white for him to sign. And he said, no, get him one of the color ones. So the aide went and cut it. And, and that, was, that picture was in my office on my bookshelf for, for years. And now it's, it's part of this thing that I was given for my retirement. And it has a, a prominent place in my home office these days. That's John fantastic. Lewis made a lot of difference to me in who I became. Well, then we we owe another debt to uh, John Lewis. Then, uh, particularly the, particularly those of us who had the joy uh, of of being taught by you. I think that uh, one of the great things we learned here is the old, uh, as it says on the walls at Poly High, you know, enter to learn, go forth to serve, and uh, yeah. we we had the great benefit of learning from you. Uh, many of us went on to serve in a variety of capacities. And so the legacy that uh, Dr. King and John Lewis have and the impact it has on you, you have had it on us. As you know, several of your former students teach at Poly High either now or have recently. <laughs> and I'm sure the day will come when some of their students yeah. will do the same. Uh, thank you so much for taking this time to speak. That with was wonderful. I, thank you. I'm sorry we had the little break there. Oh no, that's no problem. You know, these are the uh, you know, technical things that we'll, you know, deal with and go through as I go along. At some point, I'll probably hire a producer who can fix all this stuff. Uh, you know, because I'm I'm half clueless. Uh, <laughs> this the, I don't, I don't completely. You saw my wife. <laughs> uh, but uh, again, thank you so much for the time. Thank you so much for the time, not just here. Well, thank the, you for asking me. I, I I was thrilled. Yeah, your story is completely fascinating, and and I'm hoping that some of the people can will be able to draw from and use. And I hope we get a chance to have you as a guest again. Thank you, Excellent. Eric. You have a a good stay at home. <laughs> well, Be actually, well. I'm in the office at the moment. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so, see, my office is only seven minutes away from my house, so I'm able to to come on uh, over here oh, okay. and get some work done and, and well, go. So from I, that say point. hi to your lovely wife. I shall. I shall. I will make sure to say that to her when I. See you when I get home. Thank you again, Mr. Gerritsen. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> bye bye. Uh, so, as you saw, folks, uh, just an incredible human being, uh, Mr. Gerritsen is, and just a fine example of the the finer parts of of education. And as you saw, there's a passion that he has both for people, and a passion that he has for stories, and a passion that he has for history and teaching, and that that comes across completely. And uh, I hope as well that in the future, we remember those kind of things and that we're able to draw upon our passions, draw upon our love for people and draw upon all of that to make us better attorneys, better storytellers, everything that we do. So with that, we want to thank you for joining us here again on Wrestling With Law and Stuff. And we want to remind you that whatever it is you're wrestling with, let's wrestle with it together. Thank you.